Hey folks, David Stewart here. So I went and saw the Lego Movie 2, the superfluously named the second part, and I thought I would do a review and analysis for you. Overall, I actually really enjoyed the movie. I was a big fan of the first Lego movie, and I like most of the Lego movies that they come out with. Um, I was a big fan of the first movie for its visuals, for its story, for its messaging. All of those were really fun and on point. It felt very original and felt like they worked within the world of Legos. And it's really hard to follow that up. This movie is a pretty worthy follow-up. It's not quite as good as the first one, but it's really hard to have the level of originality that went into the first Lego movie get repeated in this one. Nevertheless, I really liked it. It had great visuals. It had great use of Legos as a prop. And of course, it had another really good story that breaks the fourth wall, pushes up against it, and plays with it um, throughout the movie. Just like how they did in the first movie, where it was a little bit of a surprise that you had people playing with Legos. In this one, you know that people are playing with Legos, but you're trying to figure out who's playing with them. Uh, and at the heart, there's a really good story about how um, a little sister and an older brother interact with each other. One that's very familiar to me because I had a little sister growing up and we would play with Legos and have conflicts like this. So it's a very familiar conflict for me, not just in how, you know, maybe the, the younger sister wants to play with the older brother and how that conflict happens, but also how they play differently, how they approach things differently. The difference between girl Legos and boy Legos and the way girls play and the way boys play, as well as... Um, the changes that happen with attitude as um, a boy tends to get older and tends to uh, change his tastes a little bit. And a lot of that is reflected in the play that you see in the movie. Let me go ahead and dig into my usual categories and you can see some of the things that I think this movie did pretty well and some of the things that were just not the best with it and give you a, a, a good general objective idea of why I enjoyed interacting with this movie. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk about production. Uh, production involves all the visual aspects, all the sound aspects, music, things like that. So right away, I start with a category called aesthetics. And I actually give these aesthetics a 9.5 out of 10. That's a very high score. But I love the way that the Lego movies actually use Legos. Unlike the Lego productions like, you know, the Ninjago TV show or something like that. What you see is everything is actually made out of Legos. And so when something explodes, rather than just having like a flamed explosion, you see Lego pieces fly out everywhere. And um, any object that you see looks like it's made out of Legos or could be made out of Legos. If you were to go dig out all your Legos and put it together, you could make whatever they have there. And indeed, I think they sell a lot of the things that you see in the movie as Lego sets. So that adds a certain level of realism and, and kind of tactile enjoyment um, to the entire presentation. At the same time, there's a lot of interesting combinations of, of Legos and all the while that you're looking at the way that the characters are, you're thinking about how um, a person, uh, how a child might have created that Lego, might have altered the Lego. Like the girl Legos have glitter on them. Um, so you can imagine a girl playing with her Legos and wanting to add glitter to them and, and maybe just gluing glitter onto them. Um, I have Legos that, uh, I remember the first Lego movie, they had them, they covered themselves in gum wrapper foil. Uh, to impersonate robots, and I actually did that with Legos. I would stick the gum wrapper foil on the on the Legos to make them silver, and I did things like that, or I'd break the Legos to make them look differently. Um, so that fourth wall breaking is still part of the aesthetics in this movie. Um, in a lot of ways, it, is, it exceeds the visual standards of the first movie, uh, but the main thing is it keeps that same great feel. Um, it's really fun to look at if you're into Legos, and I am a big fan of Legos, so I really enjoyed watching the movie uh, visually. Uh, at the same time, the, the fast pace of the editing, the fast pace of the animation enhances that aesthetic. It doesn't, it doesn't draw away from it. And that brings me to the next category, which is animation and effects. I give those a 9 out of 10. Um, again, it has to do with the way Legos are presented on screen. They're presented in a way that is very realistic and tactile, like you could grab that Lego. And most of the Legos tend to move in a way that is how you would actually pose the Legos. Um, not just the bricks, but the people. And there's very little alterations of how people shrug their shoulders or things like that. And they actually do a very creative job of just tweaking what's possible with Legos in just a few subtle ways to create ex the right kinds of body expressions and body language between characters, but never in a way that makes you break um, what would be possible with Legos. Uh, again, like what you would do with a, one of the Lego produced shows um, where your characters would just have bendy arms. And this one that, you know, the arms are, are static and straight, just like it was a, a real Lego piece. So uh, overall, I enjoyed that. 
the sound design, I gave it an eight out of 10, which is a pretty high score uh, for sound design. I did a lot of things right. It had highs and lows, which is something that we tended to lose lately in, in movies. They tend to get kind of maximized. Um, but in this case, the the things which were loud and kind of crashed, they were pretty loud and in, in, in your face. Um, they used a lot of sound effects that were um, vocal sound effects rather than you know explosions. So when somebody fires a gun, it's like do 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 do. It's like someone making that noise, um, and that is a, it's a signal to you in the audience that that somebody's playing, right? That it's a child acting that scene out and playing that scene out, and that's why you hear that. So the sound design actually again cues into the entire aesthetic world the entire setup of this uh, of this lego universe the lego movies being performed by children um it it's not a nine or a ten as far as sound design because there's nothing super spectacular about the sound design uh like if like a classic star wars movie or or something like that and there's a couple places where you're aware that the dialogue is just a little bit lower than some of the the surrounding noise. N- never did I have to strain to hear dialogue, which is the case in a lot of movies nowadays. Um, so overall, the sound design is pretty good. I could hear the dialogue throughout. The sound effects were effective. Good job. Music score, I give it about a 7 out of 10. They use and reuse a couple of different pop songs, and the pop songs are kind of kitschy and annoying. And I think they're intended to be that way. They they have a tongue-in-cheek approach to the entire thing, and that includes the music. Um, so there's a, more pop music in this one than the last one, and I didn't particularly care for it, but it didn't bug me that much either, uh, which I was surprised with. It's like even though I'm I'm hearing the pop music and I'm hearing some musical numbers, um, which we didn't have in the first movie, they didn't really annoy me all that much. They were they were okay. Um, so overall the score is a seven out of 10 that was effective and because of its tongue and cheek, tongue and cheek use of a couple of songs and bringing back songs from that first movie and, and having new versions of them in a way that kind of expressed, um, the ongoing conflict and the evolution of the conflict with the, with the kids was, was interesting enough that I'm, I'm going to give it a bump up into average territory at seven. Um, so that gives the overall production score an eight and a half. Let's move on to story because I think the story in this is very, very interesting. I don't want to give too many spoilers, so there might be a couple spoilers in this section. If you care about that, I'm not going to try to avoid them too hard, but um, I'm going to give a setting category to this. I don't usually grade setting, but because it's a Lego movie, the setting matters. And so I give the setting a 9 out of 10. They really nail this idea that there's a fourth wall that the audience needs to be aware of. That the audience needs to know that that um, that you're ex- essentially experiencing a story that's layered through the perception of a child. That it's a children playing with things, and we start to grasp kind of early in the movie that there's actually two kids at play. There's the boy from the first movie, and then there's whoever is controlling the girl Legos, his little sister. And so the conflict is set up right from the beginning as the conflict that ends the first movie. That. His little sister is allowed to come downstairs and play with the Legos too. And uh, that's where the entire conflict arises. His little sister just wants to play with him, but he doesn't really want to play with her. And he gets upset when she plays with him. A lot like how his father got upset with him for playing with the Legos. He got upset with her because she's always destroying it. Um, At the same time, the setting also reflects the growth of these, you know, these human characters that are manipulating the entire Lego story. Um, because once we have a, a little bit of a time skip at the beginning, you see that this business-like world of the first movie has been obliterated and turned into Mad Max world. Um, like all the buildings are falling down. You have the Statue of Liberty that's been destroyed. It's a post-apocalyptic wasteland. And that reflects the boys maturing. So it's like five years later, he's still playing with Legos, but he's they're reflecting a more adolescent attitude. Um, he's more into you know, older kids movies. And in some cases, there's a breaking of the fourth wall where the the characters will flat out say that. It's like, oh, this is from, they'll reference a movie and they're like, you know, they he says something about the Matrix and like the Matrix. And it's like, it's a cool movie only older kids get to watch. Um, or, oh, I'm being Back to the Future. It's like, Back to the Future? Yeah, it's a classic movie only older kids get to watch, right? Um, so it, it really, the setting that the kids create 
reflects their attitude. And so the setting is something that really should be viewed on its own. It's something very strong. So I give it a nine out of 10. And maybe it's a 10 out of 10. It just really, um, it really did a great job with it. And um, the mixture between that and then traveling through the real world in order to get to the, to the girl world, uh, to his, his, his sister's room, essentially, uh, that, that tended to come off pretty well as well. Um, next is the character. So the characters actually do have quite a bit of growth in this movie. Both of the main characters, both um, Lucy and uh, Emmett, have a very, very good set of growth arcs. And they're the main characters in this movie. Um, Emmett's growth arc is about him becoming more mature. And again, you have a break of the fourth wall. Because Emmett becoming more mature in this post-apocalyptic world is really a reflection of the the boy who's playing with Emmett, who's been playing with Emmett for years, uh, wanting Emmett to evolve and understanding that Emmett was was representative of a more, I guess, a simple and innocent childhood. And so Emmett is simple and innocent and childlike and him needing to evolve into something that's, you know, more tough and rugged and more adolescent. Um, so that's uh, Emmett's big growth. And he has to figure out who he is and how he gets there. And he has some help along the way um, from another character that's also voiced by Chris Pratt. And there's a whole bunch of little inside jokes and, and fourth wall broke, breaking about um, Chris Pratt voicing this other um, voicing this other Lego. And here's a little bit of a spoiler. This other Lego is actually Emmett from the future. So there's a time travel plot that you understand that the kid has come up with because he's been watching Back to the Future and Terminator and they reference those. And so he came up with the time travel plot where Emmett's future self travels back in the past with his his army of raptors because he's a raptor trainer because Chris, Chris Pratt is a raptor trainer in the Jurassic World movie. So they, you know, there's there's a lot of different little pop culture references and connections there. Has to travel back in the past to make Emmett toughen up. And then when Emmett uh, is actually saved at the end, he doesn't have to toughen up. So Lucy has a growth arc that kind of runs in opposite to that. She wants Emmett to be tougher and less childlike, less idyllic, less silly. And she comes to the realization that she really loves him to just be him and to be childlike and innocent. And she doesn't need him um, to be tough. And it, when he becomes tough and he becomes rugged, it ends up basically bringing about an apocalypse in the in the Lego world. Our Momageddon, this apocalypse that they've been dreaming about uh, in the movie, which is, you know, the kid's mom getting mad at them and making them throw all the, put all the Legos away. Um, <laughs> banishing them to the, to the storage bins because they can't figure out how to play together very well. Um, so those, those two big character arcs really kind of fit together really nicely. And they were, they were both handled pretty well. Uh, and likewise, the character conflict between the sister and the boy also works pretty well. And, and that's a very familiar one to me because I grew up playing with Legos and I grew up playing with a sister who wanted to play with my Legos, you know, like having to figure out how, uh, especially a boy and a girl, because boys and girls tend to have such different play patterns, um, having to figure out how you're going to actually negotiate some play with your sister is, is, um, is a tough one. And if you're a parent and you've watched your kids try to negotiate that play, um, that can be a tough one as well because they have different ideas for how they, they want to play, but they, you know, you know, they know the one maybe want to play with each other. They just don't know how. And that's a lot of, um, a lot of the character growth there is figuring out how everybody can play together. Uh, even the Lego pieces themselves figuring out how they can play together. Um, the rest of the characters besides those two main ones, Emmett and Lucy, they're kind of static. And they're kind of in the background. But there's a great little one with Batman that I wanted to mention because Lego Batman is the truest <laughs> version of Batman out there right now, even though he's a parody of Batman. Um, he's kind of like the truest to the traditional Batman. <laughs> it's as kind of weird as that is to say. And so he has an arc where, uh, unlike recently where he didn't get married to Catwoman, he actually really wants to get married. And, and I don't know if he actually successfully does it, but he doesn't get left at the altar at the end of this movie. He wants to marry this queen of the girl Legos. Um, and so it's a, it's a very interesting character arc for Batman because of the tongue in cheek way they handle it, where he's like, he's like, how will being settled down and like, having a family heal the wounds in my heart. And it's like, because that's 
that's what it would do. Um, and it was almost like a commentary on that recent Batman number 50 where there was supposed to be this big wedding that was hyped up and it didn't happen. Um, it was almost like a little commentary on that. That's like they should have gotten married. It would have been good for Batman. It would have healed him. It would have made him a better person, all that kind of stuff. So all of that's in those character arcs. And I really enjoyed their treatment with it. Um, next plot. So the plot of the movie is pretty it, it's pretty convoluted in some places and straightforward in others so i gave the plot a seven out of ten overall it's good it drives the story forward basic plot is aliens come and abduct the leaders of the legos um, and the aliens is the sister coming down with her legos and taking his legos away because she wants him to play with her um, so there's different levels of plot there's rather than having a standard like a b c story you have an A story and then you have another A story that's happening behind the scenes and you have a B story, which is the character arcs. And then you have another B story that's happening behind the scenes, which is the kids learning to play with each other. Um, and then you have a C story, which is like Batman and another C story behind the scenes, which is, you know, more play kind of stuff. Um, the conflict between the mom, right? So you have really have like six different stories, but one that's that's in the forefront happening in the Lego world and then the story that's really happening in the real world that is projecting that Lego, <laughs> the Lego story. So it works pretty good. Um, so they abduct them and the rest of the movie is spent trying to go get the friends back. Um, they have to travel through a bunch of different things. You realize that the kids are coming up with the plot. And so the 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 plot elements that the boy is in control of reflect the movies he's watching. Uh, Terminator, Back to the Future, Matrix. He's watching all of these older kid movies. Um, the adolescents really like a lot of these classic movies and that's what he's, and Star Wars, and he's, he's kind of getting, um, He's kind of getting his ideas from those. And so uh, that those elements tend to work pretty well where I think the plot just isn't quite as good as um, that transition to that third act it's always tough to do in movies. Um, and when we do it in this one, we, in the audience, you've put together enough pieces that you can really project what the ending's going to be. And it's kind of a, it's a twist ending that's really easily foreseen. And so that's kind of what keeps the plot from being like a nine out of 10. I'd actually probably give the plot like an eight out of 10 because of those layers. Um, and just only knock it because the, the third act, you can see a lot of the stuff coming. Um, it's just, uh, maybe it'd been set up too well, or I'm, I'm just too good at figuring out plots. So eight out of 10 for the plot is what I'm going to say. Um, that gives the story overall, um, like an 8.3 or eight and a half out of 10. If we go to the last category, which is what I call general effect, which is just my general feeling about the movie. I give it a nine out of 10. I really enjoyed it. Um, I enjoyed it almost beginning to end. Uh, there really wasn't too much in the movie that I could even really object to. I remember on Twitter, some people trying to say that there was like a bunch of feminist messaging in the movie. I just didn't really catch that at all. All the messaging I got was about how boys and girls play differently. That's not really feminist messaging. How the girl just really wanted her brother to play with him. And I think there was like one line that if somebody's super, super sensitive to it, they might get some kind of feminist message, which is where the girl Lego is like, Emmett's the leader, even though you did all the work. You know, she calls him like the 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 male is the leader, even though you did all the work. She like refers to him as a male, um, but it's the sister playing with the Legos, and so I kind of viewed it through that lens. and And when you do it through that lens, it's really not it's not any kind of overt political messaging. Um, it it's really just about um, stories and how kids play and um, how kids kind of grow up and how they deal with their conflicts. That's really um, most of the messaging. So overall, I really liked it. Um, so final scores and about an eight and a half out of 10. Um, that's a really good solid score. So to me, it's a good movie and I really enjoyed it uh, for the most part. And if you are like me and you really like Legos and you really liked the first Lego movie um, or you liked Lego Batman, Lego Batman might actually be my favorite Lego movie because it's it's uh, if you know Batman lore, it's just got so many funny little inside jokes with it. But anyway, this one has a ton of of references and jokes that um, you almost have to watch it two times to catch all of them. Uh, they they just fly at you so fast, kind of like that first movie. So overall, eight and a half out of ten. That's a solid. Um, that's a very solid, good score, and I enjoyed the movie a lot. Hopefully, you've enjoyed this analysis and me talking a little bit about it. I'll see you guys next time. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. If you follow me on Subscribestar, 
And um, you can tip me a dollar through that or PayPal. Uh, paypal.me slash David B. Stewart if you want to give me a tip. That's cool too. Um, but if you're on Subscribestar, I'm going to have some monthly content that is free. Uh, for this month, it's a, it's a novella in my Eternal Dream universe, which is the same as Needle Ash and Water of Awakening. So you can check that out. You'll get that for free. Otherwise, you don't want to participate in that. You can buy it on Amazon too, and that's great too. Or just not. Just enjoy watching um, the movies. All that's optional. So uh, thanks so much, and I'll see you all next time.